In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, who fulfills his promises, who is faithful to his word, even the promise he made to his disciples in that upper room when he told them that he would send to them the Holy Spirit. For indeed, even as we read from the Acts of the Apostles today, on this day, 50 days after our Lord's resurrection, they were all gathered together in one place, gathered together in Jerusalem. He had ascended Thursday, 10 days beforehand, but he told them to wait, told them to wait in Jerusalem for the promise, the power of the Father that would come to them from on high. And here, finally, it happens. They're gathered together in one place, and a mighty rushing wind, and the Spirit falls upon them in something like tongues of fire upon them, resting upon them. And then they stand up, and they begin to preach. They begin to speak of the wonderful works, the saving, miraculous works of Jesus Christ, his cross, his death, and his resurrection. And they speak and proclaim this even in tongues they do not know, even to all those foreigners around them. And what a transformation it is. What a transformation indeed it was for those men. For these are the apostles who fled when their Lord was arrested. These are the twelve who fled and could not be found. These are those who abandoned him to his faith. These are those who were afraid and were even cowering in the upper room. In fact, this includes even Peter, Peter who denied him, Peter who would not confess that he was a disciple of Christ. And now with what boldness do they stand? Those who fled, those who hid, they proclaim boldly who their master is and what he has done. Even Peter, who denied him, now stands and gives answer even to those around him mocking this new outpouring of the Spirit. Those who were hard of heart, those who were slow to believe, whom Jesus so often rebuked as those of little faith, now they are the ones teaching, they are the ones imparting the faith to others. And those who were once unlearned, simple fishermen are now speaking in many tongues, in many foreign languages. And on their own, of course, they were not able to do any of these things. On their own, they were capable of none of them. Rather, all this was to fulfill the promise that Jesus gave to them, that he would not leave them as orphans on their own, with their own devices, their own abilities, their own powers, but that they would do even greater works, that he would be with them, that he would make himself known to them, that he would dwell with them. And all this he has fulfilled to them by sending them the Holy Spirit on this feast of Pentecost. Here are what the words which Jesus promised to his disciples. If anyone loves me, he says, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him. We, father and son, we will come to him and we will make our home with him. Now what then first does this mean that if anyone loves me, he will keep my word? It's not just a trivial matter. It, it actually does matter quite a bit. This is the words to which Jesus has attached this great promise of the dwelling of God with his disciples. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and we will come and make our home with him. So what is this keeping of the word? Well, it could be, even as we say in English, to keep someone's command, to keep someone's word is to obey, right? To obey the word, to obey what he had commanded. But right away, we're going to run into a problem. Does this mean that if we obey, if we love God, then he will love us? Is our Lord's love towards us conditioned on whether or not we obey him, whether or not we have loved him sufficiently? The very same apostle who recorded these words of Jesus records also in his epistle that it's not that we loved him, but rather the love of God is this, that he has loved us. It's just as Paul records that even while we were sinners, Christ loved us and died for us and came to redeem us. And it was Jesus himself who taught that it is the one who is forgiven much who loves much. It's not that someone stirs up love within themselves as they know they ought to do and then receives mercy and love and forgiveness. No, the sinner, the one who is forgiven freely for Christ's sake, Christ the crucified, this is the one who then loves the Lord in response. Dear saints, the love of God is quite different from the way we usually love. 
For us, we usually want something in return. We want an exchange. We want a transaction. But the love of God does not go out and find and look for something that pleases it. The love of God goes out and finds sinners and makes them into those who are pleasing to God. The love of God creates that which is pleasing to it. So no, it's not just a matter of simple obedience. If you follow all the rules, obey the laws, then God will love you. No, not so fast. Well, then what? Is keeping the word then just hearing the word, just believing the words that Jesus has said? Well, yes, that's certainly part of it, but what son could be said to keep his father's word who hears everything he says and then does not do any of it? What about that son Jesus speaks of in the parable who tells his father, yes, father, I will, and then he does not? Is this disobedient son keeping his father's word? Would you dare claim to have kept the Lord's words before his own throne when you must freely confess, indeed, that you have not kept his words and have not done these things? Or what about the language from James? In fact, we heard this just a few weeks ago when the Apostle James wrote, Be not hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word. So no, in fact, keeping the word is not simply hearing. It's not simply believing. But keeping the word has to do with both. It has to do with hearing with faith, and it has to do with living according to that faith. It goes far deeper. It goes down to who you are as a Christian, as a disciple of Christ. Jesus' words and keeping his words is who you are as the baptized. And if this is in any way confusing, then at the very least you can look for your example to Christ on the cross. There was no disobedient son. There was no son who failed to keep his father's word. In fact, Jesus tells us that he has come in order to do as the father has commanded so that the world may know that I love the father. Jesus himself is a keeper of the word, the keeper of his father's word. And he not only kept the word, he didn't just do what he was commanded. He didn't go to the cross reluctantly. He didn't go to the cross just because he knew he had to, but he didn't really want to. No, he desired you and your salvation. He did it gladly, despising the shame of the cross in order to win your life, your forgiveness, your salvation. Christ himself was a keeper of the world, so that indeed, while you were still a sinner, he loved you not only in word, but in deed. While you were still a sinner, he died for you. It's who he is. It's his very identity. And now, dear saints, as the redeemed, as the baptized, it is who you are. You are keepers of the word. It's who you are in Christ according to your baptism. You still have that old flesh that hates keeping the words, but you also have the new man. You also have a new spirit within you, and that's what Pentecost, after all, is all about. As the redeemed, you are those who have been forgiven much by the blood of Christ, and so now you may love much. Just as the Son did the will of the Father, he did it so that you too now might be sons of the Father doing his will. He kept his Father's words in word and deed so that you now might be keepers of the word. Not just those who believe and do not do, not just those who do and do not believe, but those who are all the way down, redeemed by Christ crucified, and keepers, treasurers, storers up, contemplators of his word. It's who you are in Christ. Of course, it's not who you are in yourself, and that brings us back around to the apostles. In themselves, they were poor fishermen from Galilee. In themselves, they could not speak in other tongues. In themselves, they were too afraid to stand up and speak boldly the things of Christ. But if the word of Christ can call forth creation out of nothing, if the word of Christ can turn water into wine, If the word of Christ can turn Peter the denier and Paul the persecutor into great preachers and great teachers of his word and apostles, dear saints, how much more can it do to you? How much more can the Lord's own spirit do with you? It is the word of Christ, then, that this is all about today. Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. It is the word of Christ which you have heard this morning. It's the word of Christ which you are hearing preached at this exact moment. It is the word of Christ which gives to you forgiveness from the cross. It is the word of Christ by which the Spirit constantly brings to your remembrance 
the things which Christ has taught in order to keep you in Christ's words, in hearing them and in doing them. It is through Christ's words that the Spirit is given to you. Even as Paul says to the Galatians, he tells them it was by hearing with faith that you received the Holy Spirit. So, dear saints, hear again the Spirit bestowing words of Christ. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And really, if you haven't stopped to think about it, what a promise that is, that we will come to him. We, the Father and the Son, we will come and we will make a home, we will make a dwelling, we will dwell with the one who has been redeemed, who has been baptized, who is a keeper of my word. Such is the sublime promise that God himself comes and dwells with his faithful believers. He is not a distant spirit off in the sky, off in the heavens somewhere. He is with you. He is in you. First, the Holy Spirit himself, as Christ promised. He said, I will send another helper to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. As we confess in our creed, he is the Lord and the giver of life. The Spirit who was in the beginning, God, with the Father and the Son. The one who breathed life into the world. The one who breathed life into our first father, Adam. The Spirit of the Lord who dwelt and was worshipped with the Father and the Son in the holy tabernacle of old, in the temple in Israel. The Spirit of the Lord who was even then at work, bestowing God's blessings, giving his holiness, communicating it to the people. He is also the spirit of prophecy, the one who spoke by the holy prophets of old. He is the seal of salvation, the anointing from on high. Dear saints, what love is this with which the Father and the Son have loved you? What a gift they have given to you that not just some created spirit, not just some virtue, not just some noble gift. They give to you a person. They give to you God himself, the Holy Spirit, as a gift that he would come to you and make your pitiful, shameful, corrupted heart into his own holy dwelling place. And as if that weren't enough, it's not him alone. For he says, the Father will love you and we will come to you and make our home with you. When Christ walked upon the earth, he was there revealing the Father to his disciples in his own flesh. It's what he tells Philip at this Last Supper. When Philip asks, please, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus says, Do you not know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he says, because I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Well, so now also that our Lord has ascended on high, it is the same with the Holy Spirit. He has come to be the revealer of the Father and the Son, for he is one in essence with them. He is in them and they are in him. And there is nowhere where the Holy Spirit dwells, where the Father and the Son are not also present and active with all their gifts, bestowing and giving and cleansing and healing. This is what the Holy Spirit is all about. Dwelling within you and bringing to you also the fullness of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. And what does Jesus promise that this Holy Spirit dwelling with you is going to do? Well, he's going to tell you about Christ. He's going to give you those words that are so important, those life-giving, Spirit-bestowing words. The Spirit is sent to remind you of all those things which Jesus has taught. His job is always to point not to himself, but to point to Christ crucified and what he has done for you. In this is the Holy Spirit's great duty. In this way, the Holy Spirit makes you holy by giving to you Christ. In this way, the Holy Spirit gives you the forgiveness of sins through the word which is preached to you. And out of all this, then we have the result in Jesus' own promise, peace. Peace I give to you, he says. Through bestowing the Holy Spirit, the disciple then, who has received this wonderful gift, has peace. The peace of knowing that one is loved by the Father. The peace of knowing that through the cross one has been reconciled, that all one's sins are paid for and forgiven. And so then we give thanks, especially on this Feast of Pentecost, that our Lord indeed fulfilled all these promises. First on the cross when he enacted them in his own flesh, but then at last on this Feast of Pentecost when he poured out this Holy Spirit on the disciples. 
He poured him out so that they might go and preach the gospel, might speak of the wondrous works of Christ, so that it was not them but the Holy Spirit preaching it through them who converted 3,000 hearts that day. By this indwelling of the Spirit, those who were unlearned spoke of the hidden mysteries of heaven. Those who had been fearful were made brave and bold to proclaim the gospel. They went forth into much danger all around the world. They endured cross, they endured fire, they endured steel. What then, dear saints, can the Holy Spirit do for you? You who are no worse than those men. You who are no greater sinners. Now you weren't there. You weren't there on that Pentecost. So how then are you to receive the Holy Spirit? Well, Peter, in preaching his first sermon on that day of Pentecost, gives you the answer. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. First, he accuses them. He lets them know that it is because of their sins, because of their not keeping the word, that Christ the Lord was crucified. It cuts them to their heart. It drives them to repentance, to fear of God, to know that they cannot go on in the sinful way they have been living. What then shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You and your children and all those who are far off. Dear saints, you are those who are far off. Far off in time and space from when Peter spoke those words. And yet even to you, the Holy Spirit has come through the word and the sacraments. First, through holy baptism, when he washed you and cleansed you. And sent into your heart the Holy Spirit to dwell with you and make a dwelling place for God in you. And now also through the word preached, with the sacrament given at this altar, you are filled again with the Holy Spirit, with his forgiveness and his life and salvation. So that even you, even with your sinful heart, even with your faltering will, you are now a temple of the Most High God. Or rather, I should say, all of you together are built up into a temple of the Holy Spirit. Once again, the love of God does not look around for that which is already holy, that which is already good and pure, but it loves nothing more than to look for those who are sinful, those who have fallen, those who are weak, and to make them into his holy, righteous ones, into his dwelling place. Jesus came not for the righteous, but for the sinners, and he died for them upon the cross, not for those who thought they were already good and pure, but he died rather to bring mercy and forgiveness to those who would receive it, those who were sinful. And just as the love of the cross is faced and turned exactly towards those who are not good and who need it most, so the Spirit comes to dwell not in the righteous, but in sinners. So now, dear saints, you are pure sinner no longer, but now you are sinner and saint. Sinners also who have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, so that now, when you leave this place, and you go and you wake up tomorrow... You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and working with you. You are actually enabled to do something. You can actually do something good and pure because the Holy Spirit is working in you. There are choices you can make tomorrow to do good deeds in the name of Christ, to carry out the fruit of the Spirit within you, to work with the Spirit, to love your neighbor, to serve your family in your vocation, to love God and to love one another. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. And indeed, above all, then, the Holy Spirit's work in you is to remind you of Christ. That you may know the gifts he has given to you. That you may know these gifts as they are at work in your life. And that through them you may have peace. So it is always my prayer for you, dear saints. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him then who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.